Well, I'm sure the mood of the Israelites was just like what you're experiencing here as they've crossed over the Red Sea. Well, it's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning, isn't it? it truly is. Good to have Ed Warner back with us today. Uh, praise the Lord. The Lord is uh, healing him. That's a, a blessing going in the right direction. So we're excited about what God is doing. This morning, if you need a Bible, these fine gentlemen would be happy to place one in your hands today. Just slip up your hand. They'll make sure that you receive them. We are in Joshua chapter 4. If you'd like to turn in your Bible this morning to Joshua chapter 4, uh, we're going to be examining a passage of Scripture that follows one of the greatest miracles in all of the Scripture. In Joshua chapter 3, we find that God is doing some amazing things. And what he has done is he's dried up the Jordan River so that the people of Israel, one to two million of them in total, were able to cross over. Not only did they cross over, but there was no mud to walk through. They crossed over, the Bible says, on dry ground. Our God is a God of miracles. But understand this, that as you look at throughout all of the scriptures, you will find that there are specific times when God seems to be doing more miracles. There are extensive periods of time when there are no miracles to be seen. Still, we know that God is at work. This time period here in Joshua chapter 4 is not one of those quiet times. It's coming off the heels, as I mentioned, of one of the greatest miracles of all time. And when we think about what God is doing... The one thing that God makes very, very clear is since I have done this great miracle, I don't want my people to forget. Because frankly, we tend to be forgetful. Let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we just thank you that you've given to us your word. May we look at it, Father, with a serious intent today that we might know what it speaks to our lives, that we might apply the truth that we hear from it, and Lord, thereby grow. Help us, Father, not to be a forgetful people, but Father, help us, Lord, to lay hold of these great and mighty acts which you have done, and help us, Lord, to remember your greatness and live light in life in light of your greatness. Affect our hearts, I pray today in Christ's name. Amen. Notice with me here in our passage of Scripture that in chapter 3, in verse 17, the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan. This picture in front of you is from last week. I used it. It's the Sunday school picture. You remember that? This is where the people of Israel are, are crossing over on dry ground. They have witnessed an enormous miracle. Even if the water was as portrayed in this artist's rendition, it would be a significant, significant miracle. But the fact of the matter is, 20 miles away, there stood on edge all of the water that was flowing down, and the Bible says it stood upon itself in a huge heap. And I noted last week that if it stood at 1,000 feet, it would be visible for 38 miles. And people everywhere throughout the Canaanites' lands would be able to notice that God was doing an incredible miracle. And when they heard that the people had crossed over on dry ground, they would have come to remember all of that vision of the water standing on end. I personally believe it was a lot higher than a thousand feet. I personally believe it was so enormous that it couldn't be missed. The people everywhere were talking. This was a miracle of such enormous proportions that the word of it would carry forth from that specific point of where it happened around the world. Notice with me that when we come to chapter 4, all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan. The Lord spoke to Joshua saying, this is what I want you to do. So again, this isn't Joshua just doing this. We have Joshua receiving from the Lord what was next. And what is next is very, very interesting. Because God tells him to take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one from each tribe, and command them, saying, take up for yourselves 12 stones from here, 
out of the middle of the Jordan. From the place where the priest's feet are standing firm and carrying them over with you and lay them down in the lodging place where you'll lodge tonight. And so Joshua does that. He calls these men. They're told to, to get a stone, put it on their shoulder, and take it out of the middle of the river. And we find that there is one stone for all of the tribes of Israel, making it a total of 12 stones. You can count those stones. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay. There are 12 stones there. And he says that this was very important to do. And he is going to tell them then to come down. So here's all the people crossing. And you see this right, this here, right here? I have no idea what that is. So, <laughs> so over here we have the stones. And it's in this area where the priests are there with the Ark of the Covenant that they are to gather those stones out of the center part of the river. Now notice what else happens if we drop down a little further. Because we find here that the sons of Israel did in verse 8 as Joshua commanded. They took up the 12 stones from the middle, just like the Lord spoke to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes. Then Joshua, verse 9, set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the feet of the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant, were standing, and they are there to this day. Now, this is pretty fascinating, but this is what happens. Here, these men, these 12 men, whoever they were, this guy right here, notorious one, <laughs> they are going to take these stones across from the center here, and they are going to take them to a place called Gilgal, and I'll say more about that in a moment. That's the first thing we need to remember. The second thing we need to remember is that in verse 9, Joshua is going to go down and he is going to erect upon a rock pile there 12 stones that he is going to make a mound of right there in the middle where the priests were standing. So we've got a pile of stones that are going to be there in the middle of the Jordan River, and we have 12 stones that have been taken out of the Jordan River that are going to be on land in a place called Gilgal. Now, why is this even significant? What is the purpose for this? What is God trying to do? What God is trying to do is trying to cause the people of Israel to have something to serve as a memorial. And what's the purpose of a memorial? A memorial is there. We're surrounded by them. You can go to D.C. and there's lots and lots of memorials. But there's causing us to remember things that were done before that were matters of significance, whether it's people who lived or historical events. All of those things are important. The people of Israel have many things to mark life by because there were so many things that God did that were special that they needed to remember. When Constantine, the emperor Constantine took over, he was the first one to memorialize certain places. He was a prolific builder and so he built up certain things. One of the things he built up was on the Temple Mount uh, where the Jews and the Muslims have their places of holiness. And another place was the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem where Jesus was born. So the Temple Mount being a place where uh, there's significance because of the ascension and other things. Uh, third place is the Holy Sepulchre, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre where it was believed that Jesus was crucified. And a fourth place, believe it or not, is in Hebron. It's a place where they believe Abraham lived. And it's a place known as Mamre. Mamre was an interesting place because that's where the angel of the Lord came and spoke with Abraham and told him that he was going to have a son. And he laughed and said, oh, I don't think so. My wife is getting old and don't, don't talk about me either. 
And this was a very special place. And Constantine built that place up as a memorial as well. It's interesting, but they've done some excavation there. If you go to Hebron today, and it's a very dangerous place for us to go today, but if you went there today, you would find it was a built-up city, but it has this almost an area that looks like rubble in the midst of the city, but no one's ever built upon it. And in that rubble, you'll find an area for the well in the one corner. And then there are a couple of other places where they're in bedrock. There are these amazing, amazing, perfectly round just about holes in bedrock. And it's there they believe that the ancient trees, those great trees there in Hebron where Abraham lived in Mamre, were growing up through that bedrock and they made these holes. And so Constantine evidently recognized that as the place where the angel of the Lord spoke to Abraham, and so it was memorialized. And to this very day, no one has taken it over and built a house on it. There's not a basketball court. There's not any of those things. It is set apart. Well, it's kind of cool when you stop and you think about that because these are places of memory. These are places where your mind kicks back to what's happened. In Joshua chapter 3, you perhaps have one of the greatest, well, you do, you have one of the greatest miracles of all time. And it would be absolutely horrible for the memory to be lost. And so what God does is he initiates this in Joshua chapter 4 so that the people will remember what God has done. So make a rock pile from the stones in the river, place them in Gilgal. Number two, make a rock pile in the middle of the river where the feet of the priests were and leave them there in the middle of the river. Now, it might sound curious to you and you might be thinking to yourself, how does this really play out and what's the significance here? Well, a rock pile is a rock pile, but I want you to show you this. This is a nice little uh, creek up in Pennsylvania. And you'll notice there that uh, if you were to take a look at river rock or river stone, what stands out about river stone? Why is it different than the other stone? It's smooth, exactly. And so if you have river rock, if you have beach stones, if you've gone to the beach and you pick them up, you know that the ebb and flow of the waves take the edges off of the stones and they're very, very distinct. When the people surrounding the area of Gilgal would see those stones, they would notice those stones really don't belong here. Because all of the other stones and all of the other rock were jagged and sharp on their edges. But these could only have come from the Jordan River. And how did they get there? Because there's no one who's going to go over there and dive down and grab one of these stones and put it on their shoulders, pop back up to the surface of the water and swim with one arm over to the shore with this stone. Not only that, but this was a special time when the people of Israel in Joshua 3 cross over the Jordan River. It was the time of year when what's happening? It's flooded. And so there is way more water than there normally would be. The Bible says after the people of Israel hurried across that the waters came back and they flooded over the banks just like they had been prior to this miracle. Maybe you've seen a river that's dried up and you see all of those stones exposed. Recently, there was a flash flood in this very area. I don't know if there was a lot of water that came down through this creek. But there are times when we see the water overflowing the bank and you certainly can't see any stones. And then as the water recedes in a time of dryness, the stones become apparent. I want you to think of it this way. You have these strange looking stones in Gilgal that can only be explained as coming from the bottom of the Jordan River. And then you have Joshua has built this monument up, this stack of stones. He's built them up in the midst of the Jordan River. And as the water recedes, oh, look, I see the top of one of those stones. Oh, look, I see another one. Oh, I see another one. Who swam out there and built that monument of stones? You say, well, no one could. Exactly the point. You see, it all points back to God, doesn't it? And this is what the remembrance is all about, pointing back 
to this great miracle that God has done. There's three objectives, I believe, for God doing this here. And so I want to draw your attention to these three objectives. Number one, this was a memorial sign. If you notice with me here in chapter 4 and verse 6, just that first part, he says, let this be a sign among you. It's a sign. It is a sign and it is a memorial, chapter 4, verse 7, at the latter part, it is a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. They were to take those stones, these 12 men, and put them in a place called Gilgal. If you look at the Hebrew word where Gilgal comes from, it means literally a circle or a rolling action. To roll away from would be literally what the word means. And so if you were one of these Jews, you would look at Gilgal and you would understand that that's what the word means. It means to roll away. And the idea here is that what God was trying to tell them was that this is the rolling away of the reproach of Egypt. They were starting off brand new. There was a lot of reproach that was associated with Egypt. Egypt wasn't a good experience for the people of Israel. They were enslaved there. They were being blessed and they were growing in number, but they had no freedom and they were not following Jehovah God at that point. And God leads them out as his people and he establishes them with this promise that he has made long time before and now they can go into the promised land. It's exciting. This is new. This, this is really, you know, something to get excited about. The reproach is rolled away. And God is saying, I've got something brand new in front of you. You are going to reap the blessings now that I have for you. What a tremendous joy. What a tremendous blessing. Well, what's so neat about this is I'm thinking to myself how Jesus Christ has rolled away the reproach of my sin. If I could make that analogy and pull it across the aisle into the New Testament, I would say that what a joy it is to stop and to think about the fact that my sin and the reproach of my sin before a holy God has been pushed away. Is that something to be excited about? Is that a reason to remember what God has done? Absolutely. And so the people of Israel needed to be reminded, and this should be a source of encouragement to them. They see these stones and they look at these stones and they're reminded of the sovereign power of almighty God. This is magnificent. In times when there's trials, in times when there's difficulties, the people of Israel could look upon these stones and remember that God is not dead. That God is alive, he's all powerful and he's at work in the world today. And that should bring them tremendous comfort. The second objective, I believe, here is to promote instruction to future generations. Notice here the end of that verse 6. We read the beginning of it. It's uh, going to be a sign. But he says, let this be a sign so that when your children ask later, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you'll say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. Notice over there later in the same chapter, verse 21, he said to the sons of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what are these stones? then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel, cross this Jordan. There are actually five verses that are dedicated to parents reminding subsequent generations of this mighty miracle that God has done so that the children never forget. When you look in the Old Testament, there are literally dozens of places where God says, I don't want you to forget. Don't forget about me. Don't forget about my statutes. Don't forget about these commands. It's important that you remember them. 
And it's absolutely vital that you teach them to the next generations. Go back with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. In the beginning of that chapter, a chapter, no doubt, we've referenced it before, but something that you're probably familiar with. He says in the beginning of Deuteronomy chapter 6, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you're going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. I don't want you to forget. Notice he says that it's going to be a temptation to forget about me. He says it'll come to pass, verse 10, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, when you get into this land and there's great and splendid cities that you didn't build, houses full of all good things you didn't fill, hewn cisterns you didn't dig, vineyards and olive trees you didn't plant, and you eat and are satisfied, then watch yourself. He says, because you don't want to forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall fear only the Lord your God. Parents, there is a responsibility we have. When everything becomes a life of ease, there is a temptation to forget about all of the great works of God. Now, at this point in time, because of this crossing, there's no one in the group who's forgetting anything about God. It is right in front of their grill. They see it and they know it. They're still talking about the hornets that drove out Og the giants that encountered them. They're jazzed up about coming out of Egypt and they're jazzed up about all the things that God is doing. And it's an image in their mind when they stop and they think about the water laying up on a heap and crossing over on dry ground. That's not the problem. The problem isn't now. The problem is when you walk into the Hittites' home, the Perizzites' home, and they've been driven out, and you climb into their lazy boy, and you turn on the TV, and you kick back, and, and you're sitting there thinking to yourself, man, this is great. Our God is so awesome. You think that in the beginning, but as time goes on, pretty soon you're used to it. And frankly, you're not even sure you need God anymore. He did a great thing for you, and that's wonderful. We'll just go and see what's going on on the Sabbath day and set it aside for him. But the rest of the week, what is the big deal? And the children and the grandchildren, he says in verse 2, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord. It's going to be possible for them to forget. Now, you can have all of the teaching, all of the catechisms, as it were, taught to subsequent generations, and you can do it in a very clinical manner. And then you can be surprised when children walk away from God. Because there's something else that needs to take place in the hearts of young people. And it's something that we've oftentimes missed. It's not maybe so much that we've missed it as it's missing from our lives. I can get my kids to go to Awana. I went to Awana. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st Samuel, 1st Kings, 1st Kings, 1st Kings, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, you get it, right? <laughs> Done. That's great. But it doesn't do anything. You see, the people of Israel experienced the working of God, his mighty acts. And it's the experience of interacting with a holy God that needed to be conveyed to children and grandchildren. We live in a time when even going to worship God is pretty optional in the church today. 
If you got something better to do, you go do it. It's more fun, more exciting. We wonder why, if the majority of the polls are correct, most people don't read this and most people don't pray. I would submit to you that most people are not experiencing the working of God in their life. And if you don't experience the working of God as a parent in your life, you'll convey no reality to your children. You can teach them all the books of the Bible. You can teach them to parrot out verses. That's, that, and that's good. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you miss the dynamic of God at work in my life, you miss it. The people of Israel needed to remind subsequent generations there is a reason to fear the Lord. And if you don't convey that to them, don't be surprised when they forget about God. We have whole generations, second generation Christians that are forgetting about God. When you come to Deuteronomy 6, it says you ought to be thinking about God when you wake up. You ought to be thinking about him when you go to bed. This is normative. Thinking about God. You're sitting there right now and you're thinking about your fantasy football team. And you're sitting there going, what did he just say? I'm supposed to, what? I'm trying to figure out if I play this guy or that guy. But it's reality. Most of us are not thinking about God. It should be as natural as breathing in and breathing out. God is my everything. God is my all. And I'm going to teach my kids how exciting it is to serve the Lord. I'm going to teach them how amazing God is. I'm going to tell you God is at work in our lives. He is at work in this world as crazy as it may appear. He is at work working all of the time. We need to promote the working of God to future generations. I won't take the time to do it, but Psalm chapter uh, 78, we had gone through that a couple of weeks ago. That's a great read. Read the rest of that chapter. It's amazing. It's amazing. It reminds us about God being at work. It calls into question the wh whether or not we're truly talking about the Lord to our children and, and educating them about the work of God as well giving testimony of the working of God is absolutely necessary. A memorial signed to other nations is the third objective. You can notice with me here, if you go back to Joshua chapter four, you'll see here in Joshua chapter four, the people needed to recognize, and we're talking about people in the whole world. Notice what he says here, he says, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. This is a sign, this great miracle, where the water is up on edge. It's a sign not only to the people of Israel, listen, you guys need to carry through with this, take the land as I have told you it needs to be taken, I'll do all the work for you, just be obedient. And... Teach it to your children. Get them engaged in how awesome I am so that they don't walk away and forget. And then he says, thirdly, he says, this is a sign of the whole world. The whole world needs to know. And what do they need to know? That all the people may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty. My friends, there is only one God, and our God is mighty to save. His hand is not shortened. His power is not diminished. Our God is amazing. And there is no one that compares to him. And the whole world needs to know how amazing our God is. Oh, you can take all the technology and you can take all that stuff and just set it aside. Because there is nothing that compares to God. And it is absolutely necessary for us to understand the significance of our God. So that we might fear the Lord, he says, our God. The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. I believe it's a healthy thing for the nations of this world to fear the Lord. Do you agree? 
the one true God, the one true God. And unfortunately today, I'm not sure we as Christians have really been conditioned to fear the Lord. Because we're taught over and over and over again, and I am so thankful that my sins are forgiven. I am so on top of the fact that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I am overjoyed with the fact that I can reach out to to God and call him Abba, Father. But none of that changes the reality of me being in fear of Almighty God. None of it changes the reality that there is one who is sovereign, there is one who is omnipotent, there is one who is omniscient, there is one who is over all, and I don't compare. Thank you, God, for allowing me to reach out and call you Abba Father, but understand my reluctance. When I get to heaven, I'm not looking for anybody. I'm getting on my face. The fear of the Lord, oh, I pray that I would fear him more than I do. You say, well, Pastor Kevin, you don't have to fear the Lord. You do what you want to do. I know that verse is true. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom because it impacts everything as I understand my God. The nations around them needed to know that there is one God and he is to be feared. You look at his mighty acts and you take a step back and you say, now what, Lord? Now what? What do you want from me now, Lord? And when God speaks and the truth comes out, I listen and I understand that there is a very painful consequence for not putting my faith in Jesus Christ. A reality that the Bible talks about and it's called hell and Jesus talked about it at length. That's a reality that people don't want to deal with but it's still there, it's in this Bible and you can't get around it. And that's why I need Jesus Christ. I am so thankful for my Jesus who came and and took upon himself the sin of the world that I might have everlasting life by virtue of faith in him and in him alone. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 11 says, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes which I am commanding you today. Remember God. He is to be feared, yes, but he is to be obeyed. And we are to follow him, his commands, and his ordinances. The people of Israel are being called upon by God to remember him. Remember me. When you see these stones and they look out of place and they're smooth and everything else is rocky, remember the miracle that I did and teach that reality to your children so that they understand how awesome I am. In the New Testament, we come to faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus says to us, by giving word to the Apostle Paul, that what we should do as we meet together as a body of believers is come together for one of the two ordinances. First ordinance is believer's baptism. We understand that when a person places their faith in Christ, they should follow that by being immersed in water, declaring what has happened on the inside of their heart publicly, and be truly a follower of Jesus Christ. Second ordinance is, is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we are reading, this is my body which is for you, this do in what? Remembrance of me. Remembrance. God wants us to remember him. Is it possible you say that we could live our life in such a direction and such a pace that we would actually not remember what Jesus has done for us? We become oftentimes complacent and we need the reminder that Jesus went to the cross for our sin because we don't have a message every single Sunday that deals with the resurrection, for instance. And sometimes we just need to be brought back to the reality of our salvation and be thankful to the Lord for our salvation. And spend time thanking him. Lord, thank you so much for going to the cross for my sin. 
for hanging there on the cross and taking upon yourself, your sinless self, your perfect self, my sin, allowing me to come by faith and receive eternal life. What an amazing, amazing reality. And so I thought it a good thing for us to take the time this morning and observe the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we have the giving of this ordinance to the church, whereby the church spends time remembering what Christ has meant to us. And I was thinking to myself, I thought, what do we tend to forget? What do we tend to forget? If we need to remember about Jesus, what do we tend to forget? I tend to forget that God is still God, that there is one who is sovereign, one who is over all, one who is all wise. I tend to forget that God is all sufficient, like somehow I need to help him, like somehow the world is a mess and I need to do more. God is all sufficient. I also need to remember that I walk by, I'm supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. I almost said, I, I forget that I do walk by faith. And that's like, well, I'd like to walk by faith more than I walk. But I'm called to walk by faith. We as children of God are called to walk by faith and not by sight. We tend to loft back into that. We tend to say, okay, I, I don't see God in my life. I don't see his interaction. And so I'm abandoning ship and doing it my way. We tend to forget that God has full ownership of us. We are bought with a price, therefore glorify God, he says, in your body, which is the Lord's. I also tend to forget that the Holy Spirit of God has taken up residency in my heart. He's in my life. It is God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit who now lives within me. I tend to forget sometimes that God is faithful. As wonderful as he is, I need to be reminded that God, my God, is faithful. And I need to be remembering that one day I'm going to stand before him. And it might not be too long. As the men come forward, I trust that you'll take time as the elements are being dispersed to take a moment of time and look to the Lord, asking God to draw near to you as you draw near to him. One point I need to clarify is this is an opportunity God invites his people to come and observe. If you're here this morning and you're not sure of your own relationship with Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to make sure that you have placed your faith and trust in him before taking part of these elements. The Bible says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we're called upon here to do. May the Lord be honored and glorified as we take this time to remember him. John's going to pray and ask the blessing on the bread that represents our Savior's broken body. Father, we, we do remember you. Thank you for sending Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And like Peter, we acknowledge that, you, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thank you so much for paying the penalty for our sin by dying on the cross. Thank you for bearing our own sin, our sin. Um, thank you for uh, the, the pain that you endured on our behalf. And right now, again, Lord, we remember this moment. Uh, at this moment, we remember what you've done for us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.